play that allows these companies to have predictability as they move forward. So in our world, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. But I know y'all got a lot of work to do, and I know y'all are reviewing everything, but we really appreciate all the stuff that you've done for us. Uh, and last but not least, I want to thank the Department of Economic Development, Commissioner Pat Wilson, the governor, of course, and his team. It's been, a, it's been, a, been an amazing past few years, and we've been very fortunate to, 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 to work with everybody, and we're just very thankful for all the success. So thank you all for being here today. Thank you for all that you do, and we wish you the best of luck as you go through the process. Thank you. Whoever's up next. <laughs> Uh, oh, I, I forgot, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot one, one important thing. The city is not going to be monitoring the parking. So if you saw something that says pay or whatever, you only have an hour, don't worry about it. We talked to the city and they're going to hopefully be nice. So thank you. <laughs> While uh, uh, Dr. Toma makes his way up, uh, I thought we'd take just a minute and very briefly uh, introduce the panelists. I'll, I'll run down the House side, Chairman uh, Huffstetler, if you want to run down the Senate side. I'm going to hand the mic over. Uh, my name is Shaw Blackman. I chair the Ways and Means Committee in the House. Matt Hatchett, Chairman of Appropriations in the House. My name is Chuck Martin from the 49th District. I chair higher ed uh, and serve with Chairman Blackman on Ways and Means. I'm Debbie Buckner. I'm a member of Ways and Means and Appropriations, but I don't chair anything. <laughs> Casey Carpenter, and I did not get over served last night. I had a, I got an eye injury, so these sunglasses are not to hide the hangover. <laughs> uh, Representative Dalton, Georgia, Creative Arts and Entertainment Chairman, Ways and Means. All right, we've got a couple of members um, doing it remotely, and uh, Senator Rett's here somewhere in town. I, I don't know. We should be here shortly. Anyway, uh, Chuck Hustetler, I chair of the Finance Committee. John Albers, Senator North Fulton, Cherokee and Cobb, uh, Vice Chair of Finance and Chair of Public Safety. I'm Blake Taylor. I'm cha uh, Chairman of Appropriations and Center from the 19th District, most of Southeast Georgia. of $58,000 a year, that's going to pump about $470 million into the regional economy in terms of wages and earnings. That's going to stimulate what are referred to as economic ripple jobs of the order of about 4,600 jobs. So once we start to add all those up, that's about 20,000 jobs itself associated with the facility, its suppliers, and the recirculation of the earnings in the regional economy. To put that number into context, that's 10% of our employment base. 
associated with just one facility. We approximately have about 200,000 jobs in our Savannah metropolitan area. So adding 20,000 to that is, is certainly altering and changing the nature of the, the economic fabric in the region in a very meaningful way. The 14,000 roughly, direct and indirect, the manufacturing facility and the supplier jobs, if those are added into the manufacturing category, which most likely they will, this is the most stunning figure to me. It's a 75% increase in the manufacturing base in our regional economy. Just associated with one facility, a 75% increase in the manufacturing base in our regional economy. We know that manufacturing jobs pay well above average in terms of the uh, salaries in the metropolitan area. The 5800 $105 annual wage of the earners of the facility at the Hyundai plant, that's 25% higher than the service sector wage in the Savannah MSA, and it's also 11% higher than the average private sector job in the metropolitan statistical area. So this is certainly going to have a significant influence on the nature of the uh, economic structure of our regional economy. The fiscal impacts associated with the operation of the facility itself, so just the 8,100 8, jobs on site. For the four counties, the Joint Development Authority here, that is going to result in a net present value increase of about $114 million over a 20-year period uh, uh, horizon of analysis. So that does include the cost of providing public services including first responders, police, EMT, cost of providing government services, anything that you can think of, water, sewer, utilities, uh, cost of local government, that includes that in that, that present uh, value fis fiscal impact analysis. It also includes the cost of providing public school education to the children who would be associated with uh, the workers at the facility itself. And it includes the, uh, an analysis of the locally provided incentives for the facility, um, including property tax abatement and the upfront subsidies. I mentioned the, the, the $470 million in wages and earnings every year at full development at 8,100 workers. That alone is going to generate approximately $226 million worth of taxable retail sales. So there's a significant knock-on type effect from the facility itself on local government finances. And again, just focusing on the facility itself, uh, the expectation is that there will be about 3,100 new households uh, that will form in the area as a result of this. That's about 9,000 persons, or roughly a 2.7% increase in the local population base as a result of the operation of the facility. Um, and it's interesting if you think about where these, these folks are going to live, they have a wide variety of options to select from in terms of distance to the facility that is, reason, that is a reasonable commute. Everything from the urban core in Savannah, if a person is interested in living there, that opportunity is there. That's about a 30-minute 30, 30 drive. If folks are interested in a, a suburban type of uh, living, there are many uh, areas in West Chatham and Bryan County uh, that would support that, that are within 20 to 25 minutes of the facility itself. If folks are interested in a university town, the city of Statesboro and the associated college university amenities would be associated with a large-scale university. That's only about 40 minutes away. And uh, they're in uh, the rural area, uh, in, the in the immediate vicinity of the facility. They're around the order of 10 to 15 small towns. If a, if a person would like to live in a small town, there are at least a dozen to 15 of those within, within 30 to 35 minute commute of the facility itself. And uh, to put things into perspective, the average commute in Georgia is about 30 minutes. And in our metro area, it varies from about 20, uh, 28 minutes to 32 minutes, depending on the county. So this is a, this is a very reasonable range within which uh, these opportunities for growth and development would occur in a wide variety of residential type communities in the area surrounding the facility. Um, to wrap things up a little bit, uh, I, would I would offer that this is going to substantially, the facility itself, which of course is incentivized, is going to substantially and meaningfully alter the economic fabric of this regional economy. It's going to create 
and enhance economic opportunity throughout the region, and not just for the workers who are employed at the facility or its suppliers, because you think about what would happen to kind of, again, sort of think about it as a, as a knock-on effect. As individuals who already have jobs in the region are recruited to work at this facility, it's going to create opportunities for growth, development, promotion, and advancement at their current employers. So it's not just the economic activity, the jobs, the facility, and the suppliers. As folks may be recruited into working for, that, for those companies, it creates upward mobility for individuals who already have jobs here. So these career opportunities through promotion and development will be uh, widespread throughout the region. Uh, think about the small business opportunities that are going to be present to serve the workers at the suppliers, the plant itself, the suppliers. Uh, the uh, add-on jobs from, so, uh, from the recirculation of the $470 million of wages earned every year. There's going to be a wide variety of opportunities, again, across all the types of residential development, whether it's urban core in Savannah, uh, suburban development, small town development, university town development. There are opportunities for small businesses are going to be widespread. Um, to use a phrase that you may have heard of, this is going to lift all boats legitimately for our Savannah metro area. It's going to significantly, meaningfully, and in uh, positive ways alter the economic fabric of the region. If I might just offer one bit of suggestion, humbly offered, if there might be a way to encourage our local municipal governments to accelerate their planning process to account for population growth, that would be a good thing, and also to carefully consider the issue of affordable housing in the context of the population growth that we are expected to see uh, associated with development of the plant and operation of it. So that will close my comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll turn the mic back to you. Any, any questions from the committee on this? Um, and we, we, I, I will say in, in my district, we've got the uh, SK battery plant in Bartow County coming 3,500 new employees. So we're, we're going to be looking at similar good problems and bad problems with that. And uh, I think the good's going to weigh it by far outweigh the bad, but it is challenging to when you talk about housing and, and um, workforce and all that is going to be a challenge up there as well. Any, any questions? Obviously very thorough. You, you, thanks for getting us kicked off, uh, Dr. Tone. Mm -hmm. no, uh, appreciate you being here and appreciate the information you delivered. Mr. Chairman, you. I got a question if you don't mind, Chairman Blatton. No, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. Hey, hey, fine. Yes. Uh, Dr. Thomas, thank you so much. I'm Blake Taylor. I'm from Vidalia, so not too far away from you. So some of the things you said, I've got a questions just to follow up to get some context. You mentioned 20,000 jobs. Is there any other industry that you know of? Can you give us an example of another plant in our area, or I, heck, it might be a military base for all I know, that would, has created that type of job growth in an area so we can just have some type of context? We are very fortunate in, to, in Savannah to have a manufacturing facility and research and development facility that you may be aware of, this Gulfstream Enterprises. Uh, that's comparable. It's larger in magnitude in terms of direct employment at the facility itself. So that's the scale of operation that we're referring to. Um, it's similar, somewhat slightly smaller than the Gulfstream operation. So that's a very significant impact on our regional economy as well. And the one other question I had was you mentioned uh, if you could offer one small piece of advice to us was about municipal planning. Have you seen in your research or what even anecdotally um, a community that seems to be ahead of that doing that better that we could look to um, that you might point us to say, hey, look here, this, these, these guys did it right that we can maybe replicate and point others towards? I wish I could offer that uh, guidance. I'm not well versed in that literature, but that certainly sounds like a very useful and practical research agenda to pursue to see what are the best practices for communities that have uh, faced these sort of issues. We may look to the, to the north and west at the Kia plant, for example. Um, but those sorts of developments uh, and the communities in those areas have faced or will face similar challenges. There are a large number of uh, mega-scale type investments in electric vehicle and battery plant 
uh, facilities across the country on the order of easily 50 to 75 billion dollars within the last, say, five years or so. So there should be a wide enough, say, sample of communities that could be uh, reviewed and considered to see exactly how they address that issue. And again, with the idea of identifying best practices so that we can learn from others' uh, experiences, both, as you say, good and good and bad. Uh, how do we get there from here? I think Dr. might follow up with you later on and see what you got on that. Appreciate it. Representative Buckner. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great presentation and wonderful development. I'm, I have two quick questions, hopefully. One is, do you have any suggestions of how communities can address or what they need to help address the affordable housing? If, and then the other one is, what were the incentives that you think were the, the best incentives to lure Hyundai here so that um, we'll know for other future developments? These are starting to address issues that are really outside of my area of expertise. So I, I think I, I may prefer to defer in general on that in terms of which specific incentives matter the most to firms. I know there's an academic literature on that that I am not well versed in. Um, so I, I, I could not point to a specific item on the list and say it was this one. I would offer that collectively, these all matter to firms when they're evaluating different uh, locations for growth and development and the establishment of new facilities. There's a significant amount of competition among states and municipalities for uh, these types of operations. And my casual observation um, is that in the state of Georgia, these are, these are projects that are pursued rationally and thoughtfully. And my sense is that there's not um, uh, the desire to give away the store just to attract a few thousand jobs. I think there's a very rational, careful and planning approach that is associated with the uh, recruitment and incentivizing of projects in the state of Georgia. Uh, with respect to planning for growth and development, I'm going to have to offer that one over to the, the planning specialists. I'm an economist, so you know I know there's a lot of complication, nuts and bolts and wheels to be turned and gears perhaps to grind a little bit uh, in terms of, the, of laying out a planning process that may take several years uh, when you think about, all right, we're going to we're going to identify this parcel for residential, commercial, or industrial development. It may take two or three years, for example, for a house to be plotted on residential, on a new <coughs> excuse me, on a new uh, uh, identified parcel for residential development. So accelerating that process in some way would be great. I wish I had, a, I could offer specific guidance about that and how to make that happen, but I'm unable to do so. Did you say it, Chairman Martin? Yeah, to follow, the, the two things, I guess. With the, the plant going 22 miles west of here, and you, you talked about the various places um, that people could live, and this may be in not for today, but um, tell me where we could find this information. It worries me when something goes in that large that one county benefits the most from a tax base, if you will. I mean, I know there were some incentives for the actual footprint of the plant and so forth, but and the other county um, has to do a lot of in infrastructure for people to get there. For instance, all the homes go in one area but there's a road between that area and the plant that needs to be improved, so that goes into a county that doesn't get the tax base influx. So just the economics of that. And then also in conjunction with that, you, you said this, this plan is, like your analogy, um, the rising tide lifts all boats. And, and then you told us we need to worry about affordable housing. Well, if, 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 if salaries are going up, if those things are going up, how is it that housing is going to become less affordable? It, are you concerned that the you know, inflationary impacts of all the building materials needed at one time is going to make that happen. So I'm, I'm, I'm curious to see if, if incomes are going up in a region, it seems like we'd have less of an affordability issue than we do now. With, re <coughs> with regard to your, to your second question about affordable housing, um, I would offer that in combination with the planning process and the, the free market, there should be opportunities to develop uh, affordable housing in the region. One of the more significant costs associated with, with residential development is land costs. Land costs would be lower in uh, uh, the more rural areas uh, in the surrounding area of uh, around the plant itself within 35 to 40 minutes. 
So there are opportunities I would offer that there, there may be lower cost residential land available for development that would contribute to this idea of affordable housing in the region. So I, I, I tend to um, philosophically believe that the free market has the ability to, to allocate resources in an efficient manner, but I think in combination with the planning that, process. You believe that that will happen, that it, it's not going to take government That was the question. Thank you. I believe that, that the planning process could augment that free market process, right? So that, sure. you know. It, just to maybe, I don't know if anybody else has any questions, but just, it, it, you have any other thoughts overall? I know we're focused kind of on some of the economic development tools here, and we'll be looking at other things as we, you know, go across the state, but overall tax policy in Georgia, I uh, didn't know if you had any any other observations that you might want to share with us, Dr. Toma. Again, I'll defer that to the, the uh, public finance specialists. I'm, a, I'm an urban and sort of regional generalist economist, so things get very much into the weeds on tax policy. Uh, but to, to echo what Mr. Tallison said, uh, you don't get to be number one in the country in terms of business climate for nine years in a row without doing something right. So uh, in that sense, as he says, if, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. We got to tweak things around the edges as things are required, but fundamentally, Georgia is well positioned and has performed and outperformed its peers in the southeast over the last decade or so. Fair enough. Thank you. A uh, quick question. I might have missed it. I came in a little late. I was trying to park in the wrong place. But uh, the uh, job tax credit seems to be a good economic incentive. Is there any certain criteria to get that job tax credit or any? particular industry? I have to defer on the, the, the fine analysis of the details of the tax credits. That's not an area of specialization. I'm sorry. I guess I'll get, I started, I'll get the final one. He, help me out with this math. I just don't under, understand. I, I get 20,000 jobs expected at the facility. You said we thought 2.7 percent growth or 9,100 new people in the area. I'm guessing the makeup then would come from people in this area already here moving up a level of jobs. But what then happens do you expect then that the lower level jobs mechanize or go away? Or help me understand that delta between the 9,100 new people but the 20,000 jobs. The 9,100 <coughs> 9, uh, new people approximately in terms of population change would be associated specifically with the plant itself, the 8,100 jobs there at the facility. So some of the workers at that facility will be recruited out of the local area. Uh, it is, is as likely that a majority of those individuals at the plant will migrate to this area from somewhere else, um, most likely from within the state of Georgia. <clears throat> but there's some, there will be some in-migration from out of the state. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering the question. Could you re remind me? And it could be just you have a lot better grasp of it than I do when I'm asking. But I'm getting the deltas. If you've got 9,100 people moving in, we've got 20,000 new jobs. I get it that in the area, We'll move some people up to a higher job that'll be at this facility. They'll make more money, as you spoke about, the rising tide raising the ships. What do you expect happens then to their, their lower level jobs? Do you expect those get filled? Do they go away? Do they mechanize? Because um, I'm trying to figure out how I get a delta with 20,000 new jobs, but only 9,100 people to fill them. Well, that uh, uh, the in terms of total population associated with the facility, I would offer it would be on the order of about 20,000 people, a little bit more. So the math effectively would be about 9,100 new uh, persons associated with the 8,100 jobs. And so the additional uh, knock-on type jobs, the, the supply chain jobs, the jobs that are created as a result of recirculate, recirculating income, those also would stimulate in-migration and population growth uh, along with, so it, it's, it's the, the 9,100 is associated more specifically with the 8,100 jobs at the plant. And so the addition, there would be additional population growth on about the same order of magnitude to support the, the spillover or knock-on type effect jobs. To the extent that they would be mechanized, I think we'll see sufficient in-migration to fill the jobs that we need. 
in addition to the efforts that are being, the carefully thought out efforts I would offer that are being developed to establish <clears throat> a pipeline of talent for the facility itself associated with the, the institutions of higher education in the area, the, the technical colleges and, and things of that sort. So there is an effort to supply that plant with the labor that it needs uh, locally as well as uh, what we can expect in terms of in-migration. We, we appreciate your presentation and the information and uh, look forward to growth in this area for sure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Pleasure. Um, if Georgia Ports is next, if you want to make your way up, and uh, this has certainly been a, a shining star for the state from the mega rail system to the uh, inland ports. I know we've got one up in northwest Georgia. Uh, have some brilliant logistics people apparently because we seem to be out servicing the other ports and sort of the envy of the country. And one other thing I'll add, unless the numbers have changed, my area of northwest Georgia, while it's the furthest from Savannah, does the most business with the port. And um, it's, it's great for the whole state. Well, that's elected leadership at, at work right there. <laughs> and the, the House members in that area do a great job. It, uh, uh, exceptional, <laughs> along with the Senate. <laughs> Uh, so my name is Jamie McCurry, for those that I don't know. Um, I'm the Chief Administrative Officer at GPA. and. I was told that Dr. Tumlin was going to wow you with a bunch of PowerPoints with some you know, dazzle and whatnot, and I'd have like five minutes to just say something. So here we are. <laughs> Good job, Dr. Tumlin. That is all. Um, you know, I think that most of you have probably been inundated over time with the, the story of the port and who we are and how we work, et cetera, but maybe not so much how we specifically work on economic development projects. So I thought I'd take a little bit of time to explain that and then answer any questions you might have. But So for, for GPA, uh, you know, effectively we are a state-owned business. Uh, we're operationally self-sufficient. We you know, generate the revenues to cover all the expenses of the operation and our capex. Our customer that pays the bills is the steamship line. Uh, but we have our, our sales department is basically divided into three groups. We have uh, carrier sales who are really are the ones that are working directly with the, the bill payers, if you will. Then we have a group that's focused on what we call BCO sales or beneficial cargo owner sales. So they're working with the importers and the exporters, uh, you know, growing their business, attracting new business, et cetera. Sometimes that involves uh, a new economic development project. Uh, sometimes it's just uh, matriculating growth uh, for, from existing customers. And then the third leg of that stool is the economic development uh, department itself. So we have uh, a director of industrial and economic development whose job it is really to partner with the development authorities around the state, certainly to partner with the Department of Economic Development and Commissioner Wilson's team, and uh, you know, work in parallel on those projects. It's not uh, our job necessarily to land economic development projects, but it is our mission to help create jobs and you know, foster trade for the state of Georgia. So we work closely with development authorities around the state and the state as a whole uh, to accomplish that. And I think that, um, I guess in doing a little bit of storytelling, when it comes to tax credits, uh, the best program is one that's, I think, been very valuable for the state of Georgia in recruiting projects to the state. Uh, about 20 years ago, uh, a small group of us, and frankly it was when we were working on the JCB project, which is a local manufacturing facility. Uh, but to get it over the kind of finish line, we, we needed to come up with something that was a little bit more than what was uh, in the in the kitty to begin with. And so we, we created with the help of and Mr. Stevens is here, and he was a, a great help to us then. Um, but we, we, we added on kind of a bolt on to the best program, this uh, ports job tax credit that allowed, you know, candidate uh, industries to come in and if they were meeting all the criteria of the BEST program and also were growing trade through the ports, there could be just a little bit more. Uh, and that was a, a, a big key in getting JCB here. And that program, uh, I mean, that's a local example, I guess. Uh, but when you look at whether it is Northwest Georgia, Northeast Georgia, Southwest Georgia, throughout the state, there are uh, projects that we've worked on that don't necessarily seem like they're port projects because they're so far away but they are uh, trading through the ports and are benefiting from the BEST program as a whole as well as that port jobs tax credit uh, addition. Um, so, you know, we've, we're impacting 
well over a half a million jobs a year in the state, just the poor operations. And um, a lot of that has to do with the work of the folks in this room, uh, again, recruiting new business as well as growing the existing industry in the state. And uh, with that little uh, storytelling, I'm happy to answer any questions. Again, I knew you'd be exhausted by Dr. Thomas' PowerPoint, so that's the extent of my presentation. <laughs> loud. That's better. All right, just a quick question, uh, follow up. Obviously, I'm up in Dalton. Uh, Chatsworth has a uh, has a, um, a port rail system uh, you guys have up there. Um, and my question to you is, do you see that, I guess the feeling I have about it is that there's a lot of one-way traffic headed up to, up there. And is there, a, is there a remedy in the future to kind of help alleviate just, because I know dead legs are tough in your industry. And so the question is, what is a, what is the capability of us, of us producing stuff that up in the northwest corner that will actually leave the country and, and, and be more beneficial for the port itself? Sure. So I, I think, and I'm, I'm going to overly generalize and say it's about a 70-30 uh, ratio, I, I believe, import to export going through that facility. And you're right, the, the more balance, uh, and this on import-export at the terminal on the ships is on import-export if it's uh, coming and going from one of the rail facilities. Anytime you've got balance, it's an opportunity to, to be more profitable. I think in, when you look at what works in terms of a, as a rail destination, it's distance and volume to kind of get you to the math. Uh, you, you've got anchor industry up there. Uh, certainly the flooring industry is, is huge. You're great customers of ours, it, and it is a, a strong export industry. Uh, continuing to grow manufacturing in any area is going to create um, export opportunity. Not, not that all manufacturing is export, a lot of it is certainly domestic, um, but just looking at, at more opportunities to develop manufacturing in an area is going to help with the export. Of course, f Georgia's largest export, largest industry period is agriculture. And so there are areas where, like we, we do have a planned port in uh, west central Georgia. It would be very near the Kia plant, and that is an anchor, kind of like an anchor at a, at a shopping center. But the balance of that is the ag that's going to be coming out of that area. And so uh, in time, when we're able to develop that facility, it probably will be a little more balanced uh, right at the start because of the, the heavier ag coming out of that area. But ag and manufacturing is your export opportunity out of Georgia. So. Yes, sir. OK. Thank you. Thank you for what you do. Appreciate appreciate the presentation this morning and for being with us. It's a great opportunity. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, sir. Next time I'll have PowerPoint. <laughs> That's what everybody wants. All right. Next, we've got the uh, panel discussion with our uh, Savannah Regional Business Advisors, um, if you want to make your way up. And I did, um, finally, after not being able to a few times, get to uh, go through the Gulf Stream facility yesterday for about, I guess about three hours. It was a really good uh, presentation of what they do there. This one or? This one. Okay. You hold that? Yeah. Where you want to sit? Oh, I'll sit Going to kick it off, Mr. Bradley? Yes, sir, absolutely. Yeah. All right, well, th th thanks again. I just add my appreciation for uh, all the businesses that are represented here and, and what you do for, for Georgia and Georgians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Glad to be here this morning. I, uh, in honor of our friends, uh, Chris Clark and Kevin Perry, I didn't wear socks this morning. If you guys are at the <laughs> congressional lunch, uh, I hear chamber execs are not supposed to wear socks, so uh, I'm trying to get into that mode after being 20 years in, in government. So um, really glad to be here. My name is Burt Brantley. I'm uh, President and CEO of the Savannah Area Chamber of Commerce. It's great to see so many friends uh, in the room. Uh, I've been down here since uh, February, and, and frankly, I, I moved down with, uh, with my family because of the opportunity that you heard uh, Tripp and, and Dr. Toma talk about this region is uh, really poised. Uh, it has it's been an incredible place uh, for, you know, 290 years now. Uh, the city uh, uh, is, is, has been uh, really a, a beautiful spot for uh, here on the coast and for our state, but um, we're really poised to, to do something really special down here. Uh, and, and really, if you look at the growth that's happening in Savannah, it tracks the state's 
strategic industries. Uh, if you look at uh, advanced manufacturing, which you're going to hear about uh, with, with Hyundai uh, and, and with JCB that, uh, that Jamie talked about, uh, with aviation and, and Gulfstream and, and what's going on over there, uh, with our, our tourism and visitation economy, the state has invested uh, almost $300 million in expanding our convention center uh, across the river. Uh, and so we're about to see, uh, we've already seen a lot of growth in that space. We're about to see even more as well. Uh, logistics and, and um, uh, in the port business that you heard about from, uh, from Jamie. And so, uh, and then of course our, our film industry, which has been here uh, for a number of years, but has been, uh, has increased uh, certainly as the, as the tax credit uh, came in. And, and we've seen a lot of that, uh, that work here as well. And so uh, really across all of these uh, really strategic industries uh, that the state has put a uh, priority on, uh, we've seen that growth uh, happen here in, in Savannah. So a lot of that's due uh, certainly to the state leadership and making those areas a priority, but then also uh, our local leadership, which was welcoming of, uh, of all that. Um, you know, over my career, I've been uh, in uh, in meetings with a, a lot of y'all as we tried to figure this stuff out, uh, both on on the tax credit side as well as on the balance in the budget side, and uh, and it's difficult. And, and you know, I can tell you that we appreciate the position that you guys are in to try to balance uh, how we uh, fund the necessary uh, you know, activities of government that we also be competitive, uh, and um, and that, and that we are helping our industries create new jobs. Uh, for uh, for our citizens and higher paying jobs where they can uh, raise a quality of life uh, for their families and 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 uh, and then also uh, participate in our communities as well. So it's um, it's been a, it's been an honor to be a part of the of the of the system uh, for a couple of decades now. Uh, could not be prouder of, of our team over the Department of Economic Development and what all they've done, uh, and then the the role that you guys have played in helping us uh, to really be um, the envy of a lot of our our neighbors and, and a lot of folks around the country who. Who we compete with, and are really proud of the of the story that you're going to continue to hear as you go around the state and you think about all these uh, these different growth areas that we have. So uh, I'm really pleased to get out of the way uh, and and let uh, let these guys next to us talk. I'll I'll do I'll would go one at a time and introduce them individually. Uh, we'll start with with Gulfstream. You know uh, the world's best uh, business jets are built right here in Savannah. Uh, not just built, but also all the R and D is done here uh, and with a lot of. Uh, Georgia educated, uh, you know, engineers and designers uh, that are here, not only uh, doing the uh, the cabins and the and the wings, all the aerodynamics, and, and really proud uh, of the. Dr. Toma mentioned the incredible economic impact those guys have as well. I'm not able to purchase a Gulfstream myself, but I am able to uh, be proud of them being here. And so, Mark Bennett is here. Uh, he's uh, pinch hitting today. Uh, Jay uh, Neely had a little, uh, a little moving in injury uh, that he's uh, suffer uh, suffering from, recovering from. Uh, and so Mark has stepped in. Mark's been a part of all these conversations uh, and is going to share with us a little bit about Gulfstream's story and how they have expanded, chosen to expand here in Georgia when they cur certainly could have went uh, in other places. Good evening, um, or good morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman and committee members, um, thank you for inviting us to make a few remarks regarding Georgia's tax policy, specifically tax credits and exemptions. You know, tax policy is a tool, particularly in economic development, to encourage companies to undertake activities which may have short-term costs but result in long-term benefits. And when you think about the many tax credits under review here in Georgia, they are often used as tools to encourage certain actions sending signals to the marketplace to encourage actions that are likely to result in broader and bigger benefits in the future. Many of these tax policy encourage companies to make investments today that will pay off big tomorrow. I have a first-hand account of the investments Gulfstream has made in Georgia due to your leadership in crafting Georgia's tax policies. Year after year, Gulfstream investments in Savannah and Brunswick have created high-paying jobs for Georgians. Gulfstream relocated its headquarters to Savannah in 1967 for the stable, positive business environment. And in 1999, General Dynamics purchased Gulfstream. And due to the same stable, positive business environment that Georgia leaders have created today, General Dynamics has invested over $1.5 billion in Gulfstream, Georgia, making Gulfstream the largest manufacturer in the state in terms of employees, over 12,000 and a payroll which is $1.2 billion annually. The, the state's tax policies enabled and encouraged much of this growth. For example, since the passage of the sales tax exemption on parts and labor used in maintenance of general aviation aircraft, 
Gulfstream maintenance business has grown so much that there is now more general aviation maintenance done at the Savannah Airport than any airport in the world. In fact, nearly 3,000 Gulfstream jobs with an average salary of $87,000 per year, not including benefits, are in Georgia because Gulfstream customers choose to fly their aircraft to Georgia for maintenance, flying over many states who do not charge, excuse me, who do charge the sales tax. Additionally, these customers come to Georgia with the aircraft and stay in local hotels and local restaurants for several days and even several months. In fact, nearly 400 hotel rooms every night are booked by Gulfstream customers, suppliers, and visitors. Similarly, the R&D tax credit drives research and development that requires highly technical and highly paid professional airspace. General Dynamics has maintained its commitment to performing 100% of all of our research activities here in Georgia. We have nearly 3,000 employees here in Savannah who work in our innovation and research labs with an average salary of $155,000 per year, not including benefits. It's important to realize all new Gulfstream technologies and aircraft are Georgia grown, and our primary competitors are based in France, Canada, and Brazil. New innovation is a competitive advantage for Gulfstream as we compete against these foreign-based manufacturers. Our competitive environment requires Gulfstream to continually invest in research and innovation. And we are investing in research and new technologies to manufacture aircraft that are bigger, can fly faster and further and safer, more efficiently, with less noise pollution, and higher quality than our competitors. It's also important to know that we invest the tax credits back into the business and the state. Gulfstream investments in support of R&D in Georgia extends beyond its gates and into the local community. Those investments support R&D for aerospace and other industries and, in conclude, uh, and include substantial contributions to public educational institutions for development of a highly skilled Georgian workforce who can support the growing R&D economy. For example, we've invested more than $10 million in the Savannah-Chatham County public school system to fund the pipeline for our engineering jobs and our touch labor. Savannah Technical College and TCSG, nearly $1 million invested in the local Savannah Tech to fund our manufacturing and our maintenance programs. And Georgia Universities, Georgia Southern, Engin Georgia Southern University College of Engineering and UGA College of Engineering, more than $3 million. In fact, Gulfstream hires more engineers from Georgia Southern than any other employer in the state. As Gulfstream celebrates its 56th year in Georgia, it supports the state's continued focus on tax policies, like the, like the tax exemption on maintenance and the R&D credit. Both encourage high quality jobs in Georgia and an expanding economy state. Mr. Chairman, committee members, appreciate your time today and your unwavering leadership in continuing to support Georgia being a great place to do business. Thanks, Mark. Chairman, do you want to wait till after we get through to, for questions? Uh, I would, do want to point out, Mark uh, grew up in Blackshear, Georgia, and he is uh, not the most famous Bennett from Blackshear. Uh, <laughs> our, uh, evidently, there are multiple Bennett clans in Blackshear that he's, uh, he can't claim to be related to our nat two-time national champion quarterback. Um, very pleased to uh, uh, introduce Chris Smith uh, next. Chris is the general counsel uh, over at Hyundai, uh, has moved into our community from uh, Montgomery. Uh, I've gotten to know Chris uh, uh, over the, the past few months. Uh, really, really pleased uh, to have somebody over there that, uh, that answers their phone, uh, which Chris does. Uh, and uh, I know he's getting sick mostly of trip, not, not as much with me. Uh, but, um, but Chris has really been a great addition to our community, has really uh, been our connection point to our local leaders uh, and uh, is there whenever, whenever our folks call. And so uh, after a, a long career in Montgomery, he's moved his family uh, over here, and we're really uh, pleased to have uh, Chris here. Chris is going to share a little bit more about the, the Hyundai development. Great. Yeah, thank you so much, and thanks for having me. Um, uh, um, so a little bit, I, I, I think the real value that I can share with this panel is the story of how Hyundai chose the Bryan County site. I can kind of walk you through that, and then, of course, the big part of that is going to be economic incentives. So a little background on me. I came from Montgomery. Um, I worked uh, for Hyundai in Montgomery for 17 years, serving as general counsel there. I kind of picked up um, economic incentives and uh, negotiations with the state, um, that, that skill set over the last couple of years. And so starting in December of 2021, 
um, Jose Munoz, our global chief operating officer, was composing a small group of Hyundai um, employees to do site selection. Um, because of my background with economic incentives, he asked me to join that team. And uh, starting in January, we started the process of looking at different sites throughout the United States. I think it's very, very important to note that Hyundai, being the third largest car manufacturer in the world, is making decisions on not only what countries to make or to place its plants, but also where in those countries. And so once Jose was given the green light to look in the United States, our team quickly got to work. Um, in January, our team visited um, numerous sites, uh, precisely 13 sites in seven states in just a couple of days. One of those sites was the Bryan County site. Um, from there, in February, our top management and the engineering team visited several of the sites. At that point, we're starting to down-select the different sites and, um, and kind of cross sites off our list. I will note it's, it's highly, highly competitive. Um, I would kind of describe it as a very intense competition. Um, um, and with that, uh, we got down from 13 sites. I think we got down to, uh, at that point, five sites. And then in March, we um, then downgraded or uh, deselected down to four sites. And Bryan County, of course, was one of those sites. Those four finalists came to um, Hyundai Motor America's office in California, made their presentations, and, and with those presentations, they actually gave their incentive offers as well. Um, after that point, there were some rounds of negotiations, and then in April of last year, we notified Georgia that we had selected the Bryan County site. Um, Ulrich, who is sitting to my left, um, works for KPMG, and, and Ulrich was a very, very key part of our team. Um, Hyundai had hired KPMG to, to serve as our consultant through the whole process. They were with us during this first site, site selection tour in January. Um, they were with, the whole, with us the whole process and uh, are still with us today, helping with construction management as well. Um, so looking back on it, um, I kind of see kind of big picture, you know, why do we choose Bryan County? Um, the first reason is the site itself. And um, without having the proper site, um, there's really no, it's just not going to be economically viable. So everything from the, um, the geotechnical aspects of it to the configuration, the transportation. Um, likewise, the, uh, you, you want something very, very visible. So there's four miles of Interstate 16 visibility. That's really important to our brand. Um, beyond the site, reason number two would be the, uh, the Savannah metropolitan area. In addition to having a great brand affinity, I mean, Savannah is just a great place to be and has all sorts of uh, brand attractiveness. It's also um, f wonderful when it comes to logistics. And so the Georgia Port Authority gives us huge logistical advantages, likewise all the interstates and, and the transportation as well, including rail access. And then um, third is, uh, you know, part of that is the corporate peers as well. And so there's over 25 Fortune 500 companies located in the region. Of course, Gulfstream is one of those. And that was a big um, plus in our books of, of locating in Savannah. The third reason is the Georgia and local officials. And I was just telling Ulrich before this, this, um, this, uh, this panel started that I think during the process, looking back in January, that's probably one of the areas I underestimated is how important it is to have a great team. Um, the Georgia and the JDA have been absolutely fantastic and fantastic partners and um, that goes beyond money um, nearly all the time. And so finding solutions when we have problems, being there and being supportive. And so you know, it's really, really a fantastic, fantastic group of people. The fourth reason, the reason why we're here today is economic incentives. And economic incentives are absolutely critical um, for Hyundai's decision, and I think probably most companies' decisions on where to locate. Um, going back to January of last year, when we were looking at what sites to visit, KPMG put together kind of a list of, on our 20, 25 or so sites. And of course, each of those sites were based on a number of factors, including what the economic incentives would probably look like, among other factors. And then as we kind of progressed through the process, going back to April of last year during the final presentations, um, again, economic incentives came up. And um, Tripp's at a best, uh, we had a, an interview with German Public Radio um, last week, and he said basically incentives 
you know, uh, everything else gets you on the one yard line on, on the football field, incentives get you across the goal line. I would probably say it gets you on the 10 yard line, and then incentives helps you kind of punch it into the end zone. So it's certainly very, very important. And um, with that, you know, it's, uh, I know companies really crave predictability and consistency and knowing what we're getting on the front end because we're running different business models to determine how profitable a facility is going to be um, or if you, even if it's economically viable. And so having that consistency, consistency and predictability is really, really key. Um, so with that, um, again, I hope that's kind of helpful to understand, kind of you know, pull the curtain back, curtain back a little bit, and be very, very transparent with you guys of how how we located um, and found Bryan County and, and chose Bryan County. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I, I guess I'll turn it over to Alwick first. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I want to uh, just quickly pull out one of the points that Chris made there. I've heard uh, economic development uh, projects described as uh, as dating, and you're trying to look for the right match and, and the right mate. And, I think Chris's point about that down selection process is really important. It's really more like being on The Bachelor, especially when it's an OEM, because you've got this, you know, shiny uh, stud, uh, or The Bachelorette, I guess. I don't watch those shows, but you, I, get, I hope you get my point. Uh, but you've got this one, you know, uh, per, uh, company that everybody's trying to, to, to woo, uh, and there's a lot of factors that go into that, right? And, and so we've got to get on the radar, obviously, to make that very first cut. But then it's really not about picking you; it's about not picking all the all the rest, right? And so uh, every every one of those uh, steps in the process, uh, we 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 felt uh, the team felt great uh, at, at every point because we had a previous relationship uh, with uh, the sister company in, in, in Kia and, and, and new uh, Chairman Chung and a lot of the team and and and, and Orwick too that I'll, I'll introduce in a second. But um, but really at each one of those stages, you know, you can get you can get cut, and once that happened. You know, you get in the limo and you drive off, and you don't get to play anymore. And so, uh, we were uh, we were really fortunate to to stay uh, through the end and uh, and really find a, a great partner that uh, that's going to be here well past the the five years that the job tax credits uh, you know when they when they are used up and they expire and well past uh, all of those uh, those incentives incentives are gone. These guys are still going to be here making. The, the, uh, we're making the best planes uh, in the world here. We're also going to be making uh, the best vehicles. Uh, if you guys have been, uh, particularly in a in a Genesis EV that is beating Tesla on all of the rankings and the you know the ratings that are coming out, it's uh, really a really special and, and unique vehicle. And so we're really proud to have them uh, in our region. So uh, the third uh, member of our panel today is, is Ulrich Schmidt from J KPMG. Ulrich has has become a really good friend uh, to Georgia. I, you know, when I was at the economic development in the mid 2000s, about a quarter of of the projects that we worked had site selection consultants, and, and that is completely flipped now. We, you know, we see about three-fourths of the projects that we have uh, that are uh, companies that are hiring uh, a, a, an, a partner uh, to evaluate the sites and the geotechnical and the incentives and all the different, the workforce and all the different pieces uh, that go into that. We, uh, we keep Ulrich busy. Uh, he's here a lot. He's actually uh, been here uh, on some site visits uh, the last couple of days, not here, but in, jo in Georgia. Uh, and um, that piece is something that we have really focused in on, developing relationships with the site selection consultants, making sure they know what sites we have, what our, uh, what our tax credit programs are, uh, what our workforce looks like, what our educational system, what our transportation system, all those things that go into an analysis. And uh, really pleased to have uh, Ulrich here. And, and you know, Ulrich's got this, this uh, perspective that he doesn't just work in Georgia. You know, he works all over, all over the place. Uh, and, uh, is going to help us uh, understand a little bit about that that process and and, and how we um, and how we measure up. So thanks for being Thank here. Thank you. My name is Ulrich Schmidt. I'm a principal with KPMG's uh, location analysis site selection practice. Uh, I've been with KPMG for 24 years. Uh, I'm based in Philadelphia. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the state of Georgia for sending the entire Georgia Bulldogs <laughs> defensive line to the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> we'll see if it works out this year. It's going to be important. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me. Uh, I'd like to offer some comments and some perspective around the overall process uh, on site selection. So I'm what you would call a site selector. So if you've never seen one, they could look like me. Uh, our work involves advising clients really in selecting locations for major investments. We work through a wide spectrum of industries. Uh, the background on the site selection process is usually it starts with figuring out a targeted geography. And that could be a state, it could be a couple states, it could be entire 
you know, East Coast, for example. And then we analyze locations that can meet a specific client's project demands. And those are many factors, as, as Chris has mentioned, you know, supply chain, customers, suppliers, infrastructure, logistics, all figure into that overall location decision. And I'm talking about locations, not yet sites. Once these locations are filtered to the ones that are perceived to meet most of these project requirements, we actually get down to the sites and we prepare a comparative cost analysis. So looking at all the different factors, a lot of times it's really workforce. Uh, workforce is a key, key factor. How can that pipeline of uh, you know, five to 10,000 new jobs be met in a location, but also the site. Is the site ready for development? Can the site meet the project timeline? Projects are moving very fast these days, especially in the uh, advanced manufacturing, automotive uh, industry. Projects are moving uh, at lightning speed and need sites that are essentially shovel ready. So you need to have a site to compete. And that already takes some investment up front by the state and the community to make these sites really marketable. Uh, oftentimes, that's your first incentive, to have a marketable site that has the infrastructure, the utilities, the road connections that can actually meet these aggressive timelines. The process then ends with the comparative cost analysis. So we look at all factors from labor cost, utility cost, one-time cost of you know, acquiring a site, uh, you know, construction cost to the tax environment. It's a recurring cost for companies to have, you know, pay taxes and various taxes. Uh, and then incentives are essentially the offset to what that bottom line might look like. At that stage, you're looking typically at two to three sites that are competing. Uh, in this case, it was, it was uh, four finalist sites. Uh, really, the construction-ready product, I would call the first incentive. But tax credits are important to help offset certain costs. So depending on the company, depending on the project, depending on the operation, various incentives uh, could have various values depending on the industry. Not all companies are significant income tax payers, or maybe not initially. So income tax credits may or may not have a very direct impact. Usually, they have an impact because they have a carry forward and companies can then claim credits in the years where they actually have income tax liability. But there's sales tax, there's property tax, so really everything goes into that calculation of a, of a bottom line uh, operating uh, comparison, operating cost comparison, and that ultimately gets offset by incentives. Companies, and Chris and, uh, and, and Gulfstream have mentioned it both, compete globally. And I think that's a point that needs to be kept front and center. Companies have the option to invest in multiple locations. At least a lot of our clients have multiple operating locations in Asia, in Europe, in the US. So it's not just a competition between states, it's a competition globally. And states and regions and countries also compete in this game. So you're not only competing with South Carolina or Alabama, you're competing with Mexico, Canada, Asia, Europe, and as we sit here, the European Union is developing some very aggressive incentives to attract the chip industry. And they've been successful. You've seen major announcements for Intel, you've seen announcements for Tesla in Germany, which is a high cost operating location, mm -hmm. but it happens. So. It's a competition globally, and what companies are looking for is locations that can meet their operating environment, really in all regards, from a you know, overall labor perspective, operating cost perspective, supply chain perspective, but also cost perspective. When you look at individual programs, and I know that's <clears throat> somebody that's on everybody's mind, like I said, it depends on the industry, the company, the type of project. Uh, but Typically, these incentives are a temporary savings. Companies need to do something to earn these incentives. So states built in safeguards. So do the, the Georgia incentive programs have safeguards built in that you need to do something first before you even earn the incentives. 
And if you don't do something, there are clawbacks. So there are actually mechanisms if companies don't perform that money can be clawed back. That is a good thing. Uh, so everybody's held accountable to their end of the bargain, and most states have these types of programs. And I would, would offer that, you know, the Georgia programs like the Georgia Job Tax Credit or the Mega Credit or the, uh, uh, the Quality Job Tax Credits are, are very effective uh, because they can help offset tax cost. In the case of the Mega Credit, they can provide direct cash rebates to companies based on their withholding taxes that are being paid. But you need to meet certain requirements to qualify. So this is not just a free giveaway. You need to have certain salary levels. You need to have a certain size of a project to qualify for the mega credit to even be in the discussion. And, uh, and that is, a, again, it's a good thing to have these types of requirements around some of the programs to make sure they really have the right effect and, and, and the right um, outcome. Now, looking at uh, George's program, or programs like the withholding tax credit, for example, which is, is uh, very effective. Georgia is not the only state that has this program. So does Alabama, so does North Carolina, so does South Carolina. So, you know, programs are interesting at the front of this process where it's almost a marketing tool to get into the conversation. But in the end, they're really effective because they get evaluated to help offset costs, and it is truly a comparison of one location versus another. Not always is the case that the cheapest location wins. Like we said, multiple factors play a role here. But incentives can be the final, final kicker that, that brings a project to fruition. So with that, I'll answer any yeah. questions. Thanks, Laura. Back to you. All right, we, we appreciate all the, the presentations. and. Um, we know this, this area is booming and George is doing a great job in that. Um, you know, you talk about all the incentives and you mentioned North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. Of course, Florida and Tennessee have higher sales tax but don't have an income tax, so you're not going to need an income tax credit there. So tell me the thought process on, on that, if you could. Yeah, I think states have done a good job to adjust um, their programs and their tools to their specific environment. If states have low income tax, for example, they're typically looking to offset other taxes. They might increase some of their cash programs. They might increase uh, you know, other contributions to a project. But I believe it takes both. It takes a competitive tax environment and it takes some incentives or the right tools that can be combined to address a company's need. Like I said, you know, companies oftentimes don't necessarily have income tax to begin with, or it takes them four, five, six years to ramp up before they even generate a tax liability. In that case, other programs are more effective. So states have figured out that there's not one size fits all approach either low tax environment or incentives, it's usually a combination of both to make locations attractive. And after I said that, I remembered that Florida does have a corporate income tax of five and a half, so that, that would yep. be a, a factor there. So we had an audit done of the, uh, you know, we send out through fiscal audits and we were hands off of it, of the uh, job tax credit. And their analysis was that, you know, they, they had a lot more jobs than the direct jobs and all that, but in the end, they believe that only a, a small fraction of those jobs would have come, uh, were, were a direct result of the job tax credit, that most of them would have come anyway. And so that's that's the hard part, I know, for you guys, for us, is, you know, how do we decide that kind of thing as a state? And Chairman, then, if I can and, jump and, in real and, quick and, on and, that. Well, if I could yep. add to it before you do that, too, you know, we'll have maybe 10 different credits and the way each group's report comes out their one credit is solely responsible for everything that happened and measure anything you get against it so so yeah. if you could address yeah. that and that was gonna be my point i mean I, I think unless you talk to each company that located and ask them on their matrix what was you know what was the deciding factor and i think all we said it i mean there, there's there's never one and so you know if you want to take one tax credit and say well, they would have happened anyway without the, the jobs tax credit. Well, I mean, you also have uh, the, the other programs uh, that build the case. And, and by the way, investment in transportation and education, 
uh, is also uh, uh, an incentive, right? I mean, the, 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 the fact that we have a transportation system that they can use, that we have a port system uh, that is, uh, that's, that's the best around, that we've got an education system and a higher ed system. So all those things are, are, you can think about those as incentives as well, because it all plays to a part of the story. So uh, unless you went and talked to each company and, and said, you know, would you have come here if not for the job tax credit, I mean, maybe because of all the other things too, right? And so it's a whole package together that they make the decision, uh, or, or they might not have, because maybe not having that one program, uh, would it, we wouldn't have got across, you know, the, 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 the one yard line uh, in the metaphor earlier. And so, um, you know, I, I, I don't know how you would do that and how you would say that with any confidence uh, without uh, having the companies themselves tell you, uh, yeah, this was the factor, you know, that, that led to, uh, to our decision or not to our decision. And, and I don't think it's ever one factor that does it. I think what Bert said is absolutely right. Um, you know, it's the whole package. It's the environment. It's the stable environment. You know, when Gulfstream looks at adding capacity, we do look at a number of things in the tax environment, especially as, as Mark mentioned, the stable, consistent approach to that is incredibly important. So, um, you know, a real, real example, you know, prior to the sales tax exemption on MRO um, here in Georgia, we had an opportunity to add capacity to maintenance, and we really wanted it in Georgia. Um, we worked with our parent company, General Dynamics, but at the time, the business case made sense for us to put that uh, MRO facility in, in Massachusetts. And after that decision was made, um, uh, the sales tax exemption here in Georgia was put into place. And a few years later, the sunset was removed. And since that time, we have built so much capacity here in Georgia for the, for the maintenance program. As I mentioned earlier, that there's more maintenance done here than any other place in the world. So it is a kind of case by case, expansion by expansion consideration. And, and one, one other thing too, in, in Bartow County um, with the uh, escape plant coming there and with Q sales between Representative Carpenter's district and Bartow getting about, I think they're splitting that about 50-50. Anyway, the local government there, uh, because of 75 and because it's booming, you know, their opinion is they're coming anyway. And so they're getting their, you know, the property taxes right off the bat. Um, and because of that, you know, they're looking at close to a 50% increase in their digest. But they also say, you get something that's massive, we've got cost to pay, you know, and, and otherwise it's on the backs of the other local taxpayers to pay for it. So um, these, I know, are, are, you know, well, I don't know for sure because I don't have access, but they appear to be projects of regional significance. And I know that has to be hush-hush, and I understand why, but it's, it's just hard for us to get a grasp on, you know, what is what is needed and what isn't needed in in that yeah and i think the brilliance of the georgia system right i mean each local uh, entity can decide what makes sense for their community uh we've had uh I'm, we've sat in meetings with with local uh governments that, that have uh put um abatement schedules on the table that that you know that we didn't uh, i won't say we didn't agree with but we were surprised that they were that they were so generous but that's a local uh, elected official, local uh, uh, economic developer, um, they're making that decision. Local development authority deciding what what they want in their community, and uh, if you know, and if that's the decision in, in Bartow and that works for them, then then that's terrific. That's great. Uh, and other communities are, are more. Uh, I mean, I, I would tell you that a lot of rural communities that we we work in, they you know, they don't have a problem, um, you know, giving up a little bit in order to get jobs, so that their people don't have to leave. Uh, the county uh, that they live in to work. They can stay closer to home. And uh, I think this whole you know, rural economic development push that we've seen, uh, we've allowed the communities to decide for themselves, you know, what they wanted to do in terms of, uh, of partnering with a company and, uh, and bringing them in. And, and each project's different. I mean, you don't, you know, you, you, you're working with them, you're seeing the numbers, uh, and, uh, and you have to kind of put your, you know, your best foot forward. But always there's an analysis of, is this going to be worth it? For our community, and and if not, uh, and so and we do that at the state level too. I mean, I, I don't, you know, I hope nobody ever thinks that that there's no uh, recognition of of what the cost is uh, to um, you know to the state uh, and to a local government when these things are made. I mean, there's a lot of analysis done to make sure that we're getting uh, a you know a return and that the project's going to be beneficial for both our state and, and for our local community. I was going. 
This question or thought is for, could be for bachelor number one, two, or three. <laughs> <laughs> but I think when you look at tax exemption and tax credits, you have to look at the halo effect that it has as it moves just beyond just the direct give and take, but how it affects the community, lumber, electricians, et cetera. Something that I think uh, the least favorite Bennett talked about. <laughs> I'll let these guys start, but Dr. Toma you know, spoke to that too, right? I mean, I think that's so, so important to, to recognize and understand that, that it's, it's, the, it's really the generating factor, right? To your point, it's, it's, it's not just uh, the jobs at the plant, but it's uh, all the small businesses uh, that, that come along beside and provide services to, uh, to the project. And uh, really, you know, that's, uh, that's where we rely on our uh, of our, on our friends in the, in the economist world to help us understand that and know what that, what that looks like. But I can tell you, uh, I mean, we've seen some of the numbers with, with the Gulf Stream, uh, you know, employees and how they're spread out, not just here and not just in Brunswick, but, but literally all over the state. And Jamie talked about the ports earlier. I mean, the impact is even far beyond just us locally. Yeah, that's right, Senator. Um, you know, the, the supplier relationships with Gulf Stream is, is far reaching. Um, Effingham County, for example, is the the largest privately owned company in Effingham County is a Gulfstream uh, supplier. It's Edwards Interiors. So we see that happen all the time. But there's also some large companies who've relocated to Savannah. So most recently, CAE, which is a Canadian company, they relocated uh, or actually built a new facility here to support Gulfstream. CAE uh, conducts flight training for Gulfstream pilots and mechanics and flight attendants. So you look at those jobs, but you also look at those pilots are coming from all over the world to come into Savannah for six to eight weeks at a time every year to, to be certified as a pilot. So they're staying in local hotels, eating at local restaurants for, for um, six to eight weeks. And that, that requires every year. Those pilots who fly Gulfstream have to be certified every year, and they like coming to Savannah. Another example is uh, on the aircraft, it's, it's a Rolls-Royce engine. So if you go out by the airport, you'll see a new Rolls-Royce facility that um, was built in Savannah because of Gulfstream, and we dropped the engines from a Gulfstream, carted across the street, and they rebuilt those engines there. So it is a, a far-reaching um, you know, opportunity or halo effect when you look at suppliers, especially airspace suppliers and, and other high-tech manufacturing. Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, am I sure if this is working or not? Uh, thank you for the panel. Very, very informative. Uh, I think what we've talked about in the past is it's kind of an art and a science when you're measuring this, right? It's not simple just to put the numbers together with the halo effect. Um, I do, though, want to give a quick prop to our Department of Audits. Uh, they do include a halo effect when they do these reports. So whether it be the folks uh, on the committee or in the audience today, uh, they, they have taken time to put that in there. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a, a, a statement sort of in the form of question. That seems to be the way we're going this morning. I, I, I get it. If somebody gives you more to come, you know, you're, you're going to come there. What, what I think we, we see here and, and what the businesses that have been around and been invested in Georgia for hundreds of years see, and I'm just going to be honest, if it, I don't mean to dampen this, you know, but I want to be honest about it, is Hyundai came here for those incentives. Tell me how much it mattered to them that, three and four were coming online at, in, uh, down in Augusta, the, those, those two nuclear plants. And, and you weren't going to build in Texas where they have an unregulated electric market and it gets really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter. And you have in So I, I just, I, looking at that, we're focused on tax credits here, but I mean, I, I think Georgia has a lot more to offer when you're lining it up, if, if it comes down, you're just picking us because we're, sitting, we're spending more money there, then we're not getting credit for the people that have, have built the state you know, for the last 200 years and the investments that Georgia Power's made and, and our ratepayers have made in doing that. So I, I just, it, it sets me back a little bit. So tell me how much that m meant in the decision for Hyundai, the fact you knew you were going to have reliable, uh, clean, reliable, and affordable energy. Yeah, sure. That, that's a great question. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, there was a number of factors why we chose Georgia. Economic incentives was kind of one of the four that I mentioned. And, and to be perfectly honest with you, Georgia did not offer the best incentives. Now, they were within the ballpark, but they weren't the best incentives. And so, Hyundai did not go chasing after the dollar, so to speak, in its decision on where to locate. Utility was a major component as well. You know, utility cost. Um, I know I recall KPMG doing analysis of how much energy cost and uh, 
you know, with our facility, obviously, we're going to be uh, Georgia Power's uh, probably one of the bigger customers. And so, but absolutely, you're, you're exactly correct. I think energy, um, reliability as well. That was also another factor we looked at. So, yes, sir, you're exactly correct that, on that. That's fine. I just wanted to thank you for doing that. that that's the, the mm -hmm. offensive line driving you down to the 10 yard line with mm -hmm. our businesses that have been mm -hmm. here. So, I, I just wanted to acknowledge that fact that it's not all about uh, credits. Absolutely, and, and I'll add in there too. Uh, you know, Georgia Power has been a fantastic partner through this project. They are, you know, ahead of schedule. Um, they've been fantastic to work with on the construction side, and and uh, been a, been a fantastic partner. Hang on to that microphone. Uh, so I, I've got a question because I I feel like I've done just a hair bit of research, but I'm not fully educated on the process. But I seem to recall that Georgia was not the low cost provider of incentives in this deal. That that Tennessee we, we left they they were actually came in much much more aggressive than we did, but we were still able to land the project because of the port and electrical concerns, et cetera. Is that correct? Can can a poker player say? It? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're correct. As um, as I mentioned just a second ago, Georgia was not the, the did not offer us the most incentives, and uh, um, but again, it was within the ballpark is where I'd probably put it. Um, if if it was you know grossly under everyone else, then then we would not be in Georgia. But um, there's a number of factors, and I really do think it's because of the. Um, I think the I think the really good vision of our leadership to realize it's more than just the initial money. It's also relationships, and that's kind of touched on earlier, having the great relationships with with uh, Commissioner Wilson, the local officials as well. I mentioned earlier the Savannah metropolitan area, um, likewise the site itself, and so. Um, but but again, I think it's incentives kind of kind of using the football analogy kind of helps you kind of punch it into the end zone. Sure, but I think as legislators, that's what we want to hear, right? We want to hear that Georgia's competitive, but we also don't want to feel like we're the person that has to take them out to the nicest restaurant to get her to go out with us, right? Yeah. Every now and then we want to be able to pull through Chick Fil A <laughs> drive through and, and, and make her happy. Yeah. Uh, and then I, I've got a I've got a quick. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I've got a question for uh, Mr. Goldstream. Uh, you know, there's there's a lot of conversation on the R&D tax credit. Um, I, I'm obviously a big fan of it because I think that it invests into the future, and, and you can't monetize that R&D investment on what it's going to do for your business, your your existing businesses. And so I see it as it as an incentive for our existing businesses to grow. And I would just like for you to talk a little bit more about. Um, how Gulfstream looks at an investment in R&D today and how do you extrapolate that? Is it a five-year window, 10-year window? How do your models work on that? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, the, the, the innovation of Gulfstream is, is what sells aircraft. So it's a continuous investment in R&D facilities. Um, it takes about 10 years from the time uh, an engineer first kind of draws out a product until a customer receives the first aircraft. So it's a pretty time-consuming process. Uh, it's a reoccurring process. We have three aircraft currently in some phase of R&D. So if you, if you keep up with aerospace, you probably have read about the G700. Is we, we're hoping to get certification from the FAA this year and start delivering that aircraft to customers. One right behind that is the G800. Uh, we'll be coming behind that. And then a couple years now is the G400. And those are the products that we have announced publicly. Um, those of you who've toured Gulfstream, you, you've noticed the black curtains that I don't talk about. Kind of what we have announced uh, is behind that curtain. It's a very competitive industry. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, our competitors are the Brazilians, the Canadians, and the French. Uh, they would love to know what we do on the R&D timeline. Um, we, we're typically about a generation ahead of those other competitors because we're constantly reinvesting in the R&D. Um, uh, life cycle. And, and George is a good place. You know, you guys have invested uh, heavily in supporting up that R&D landscape. I mentioned the Georgia Southern University College of Engineering, a great school. They're producing great Georgia graduates who grew up in Georgia. They want to stay in Georgia. We're very effective at recruiting those students. The new College of Engineering at UGA, similar situation. Uh, the dean there is doing a great job. We're, we're, we have a great landscape in Georgia to continue pushing this as a high-tech area, and aerospace is a part of that. Yeah, and I'll, I'll quickly add uh, to the right and honorable chairman from Dalton's point. I uh, we almost never the the most aggressive on incentives. I mean, I, I say almost because we may have in a, a very rural part of the state 
uh, got really aggressive because we were, you know, trying to uh, drive job creation in an area that had not had not seen it uh, lately. But um, you know, almost always, and, and the incentive programs are very different. Other states write checks, I and mean, they literally just write a check out of their budget to a company for them to use, sort of however they want. The vast majority of our incentives are uh, are tax credit based, as, as Ulrich mentioned, where you have to do something in order to qualify, in order to get it. It's not a a cash outlay that that um, you know that um, that comes straight out. It's you know it's it's savings on future uh, taxes. And and when you see those numbers that are that get reported uh, in the media about what the, the the incentive package is, you always have to remember that's a, a maximum they could qualify for, right? I mean, a lot of times uh, companies uh, are are not able to fully qualify for every piece of the of the package, and that's up to them to analyze and see what's actually you know uh, attainable. Uh, for them, but what our role is to give them sort of here's all the things that you could do. Uh, you know, they'll work with their accountants and their and their and their consultants. They'll figure out uh, which programs they qualify for and which ones they don't. But uh, ultimately, our job is to say, you know, here are the different programs that the state has, and and here's all the ones that you could potentially qualify for. And so that that number that gets reported in the in the offer letter, you know, is is most likely not the actual number uh, that the company uh, will end up. Uh, qualifying for, but but they are able to do that analysis and, and, and they know that. And so it's not we're not writing a check out of the treasury. We're not you know we're not uh, giving cash uh, out to companies, which a lot of states do. Uh, ours, for the most part, unless it's an investment in infrastructure, whether it's a water sewer system or whether it's a, a new interchange or a, a training facility, something like that. Other than that, it is all based on your performance, either investing or creating jobs uh, or um, or doing R and D or whatever the whatever the program specifically incentivizes. I haven't really thought about the best way to ask this question, so I'm going to stumble through it a little bit. Maybe y'all can help me out. But, you know, for Bert and for Ulrich, I, do we, um, when you start uh, saying that, you know, like a Hyundai or a Gulfstream and they're out there in the market, I mean, do you have a pool of all these different international and domestic sites uh, or all 50 states? Or do you kind of end up with uh, a top 12 that you roll down and, you know, where, you know, I would think Georgia is over time has, has worked itself maybe up into that, that short list, if you will. And then I guess shifting to Bert a little bit, you know, you've been in a long time. I mean, what have you seen where, you know, when we, you know, we're at a point where we could, you know, just, just wanted anything we could get and, and now we're at a point where, you know, maybe we, we are more selective or can be more selective along those lines. And then I was going to ask Chris if he'd go down that list of A, B, C, D again, if he <laughs> would, before we leave. Uh, and so I think you're asking kind of two different questions, um, and I'll let, I'll let Ulrich uh, give his perspective, but there's, there's the site question is a separate one that I'll, I'll, I'll take here in a second. The, the are you a stable and business environment? Do you have good leadership? Are you a place that welcomes investment? Uh, all those things, that kind of gets you uh, a reputation around amongst Ulrich's colleagues about, are these folks easy to work with? You know, can they do a project? Because ultimately, they need to land the project for their for their client, right? And so, uh, that was a real push that the, that we started making, uh, really, I'd say, in the early uh, in the mid 2000s, and we've you know, continued that for uh, for 20 years, really putting a focus on making sure those guys know that we are open for business. To your point, that we are we are um, that we are ready to work with them and partner with them and figure out a way to to solve the problems that that they face when they when they land a project. The site question is a totally different question. You know, we have historically not had the sites that other states, other states have invested heavily in site programs. Uh, and, and when you go to these conferences with the, the, the site selectors, they can tell you, oh, it's the mega site over in Huntsville, or it's the mega site in Memphis. And you know, they, they get known, these sites get known. Uh, the, the Bryan County site is really you know, an interesting story. If you guys haven't heard it, I won't tell the whole thing, but we had the site in Pooler for 20 plus years. Um, the the you know, uh, Mercedes-Benz Sprinter project didn't end up making uh, didn't happen, and so we had that site sitting there in the mid 2000s. We put Mitsubishi uh, heavy equipment over there to take about, uh, I guess, a, two -thir uh, a third of the site, quarter of the site, um, and so we had that sitting over there for 20 years. It came in second, a bunch, and Trip's going to break into hives in a second, but it came into in, in second place a bunch, and 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 the local folks came to us and said the site's not big enough for the big projects, the OEMs. 450 acres or whatever the remaining site was not big enough, and so we had a, a project with Amazon 
that we were working, and Amazon bought that property from us. And so, for you know, for sixty plus million dollars, Amazon bought bought that property from the state, which we used to partner with the locals to go and buy that Bryan County site, which was almost ready to be developed into into distribution. Uh, and we were not going to have that on our on our site list. And so, virtually all the sites that we have are privately owned. Uh, a few are locally owned. A few local governments have put in the investment uh, to own their sites, uh, but we don't have. We do, we are uh, short in terms of sites, and we all, and we have been, you know, for years. And so, all the work that's happened, all the projects that we've landed, have been because our local uh, partners have either invested in sites, or we've had, you know, private partners uh, that we've been able to work with and market essentially their site, and then the companies come and and look at it. So kind of two different questions. We, I would say we're ahead of the game in terms of these great relationships with consultants and making sure that our programs are well known and we're a great state to do business. Um, I would tell you, I think the, the economic developers in the room would tell you that we have we have lagged in terms of having sites that are publicly owned. The speed to market piece for Hyundai was large part because we didn't have to go buy a site. We had it. We had it on. We were able to uh, turn that and they were, they were able to start, start to work very, very quickly. Yeah, and I think to the point of is there a you know a top 10 list that is always being submitted? I would say it depends on the project. Uh, it really depends on the industry. Um, if you think back to really stick with the automotive industry here for a second, um, there was no automotive industry in the southeast. Mercedes in, you know, in, in uh, Alabama was probably the first investment. And collectively, the southeastern states have been very successful in building an automotive industry, an automotive cluster, you know, compared to what Detroit and, and Ohio and Kentucky might have been in the past. So, you know, for automotive projects, you look at places that have the right operating environment, the right cost structure, the cluster of the industry, the workforce with the experience, the shovel ready, ready to go sites, and, and, and back to the point that was made before, I think one factor was really speed to market. Can we get to market some things money can't fix, right? It's, it's, it doesn't matter if you throw another $10 million at this problem. If it takes another year to get the power to the site, that might be the death nail for that site. So I think it's a number of factors, and we work a lot on experience, right? Where have companies been successful? Where have clients been successful? Where, we, where do we know all those factors exist? in terms of the good operating environment, including the costs and taxes. And that's the starting point. And that might be a list of, of 8, 10, 12 states that then quickly gets filtered down to the ones that get in-person site visits, where everything is really checked on the ground to make sure that you know everything is really the way the data shows. All right, well, that's. I think you want Chris to run through the before. I think he's done it twice. <laughs> <laughs> I was, was going to ask him to do it one more time, so if it's redundant, yeah. I apologize. But I, yeah, I, I, Can I, I just add something real quick? So I will kind of um, reinforce what Ulrich said. We, we were look, one of our top four finalists. The major knock on the site, and the reason, one of the major reasons we didn't choose it was it was not ready for another year or so. And speed to market was absolutely critical to our project. And so w we just had to pass it over. That was kind of the, the death knell for that project, so to speak. So yeah, so site ready, shovel, shovel ready um, is, is really, really key. Well, we're just a few minutes behind, but doing pretty good. So we, we appreciate you being here. I, I do want to add one thing. We were in the Senate in the House. We have kickball games. We have rodeos we compete in. We were at the simulator yesterday. And now while the Senate did have to take a second pass, to land the plane, came into how the first time the house did make it back to the runway, where they crashed and burned. Um, I, I think maybe forgot to get the nose up. I, I really don't know. I wasn't watching that close. But uh, anyway, and our ace pilot, Chairman Tiller, still needs to do it at some point um, as he as he flies around. We we certainly appreciate the presentation, and we're we're gonna move on to the next phase. And thanks for all the information. We, uh, on this next one, we had um, the college had run a test and we thought we had, uh, it was going to be on the screen and now they're having a technical problem with it. So uh, if you want to make sure everybody on their phone or laptop that has a link can do this, 
Keenan, after we get started, I know you set my phone up for it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Chairman uh, Huffstetler, uh, Chairman Shaw, Georgia, uh, thank you all for having me, uh, especially somebody from Big Ten country uh, speaking to Georgia uh, this time of year. Uh, my name is Ray Hederman. I'm the executive director of the Economic Research Center at the Buckeye Institute in Columbus, Ohio. We're a think tank that specializes in economic research, analyzing the impact of public policy in Ohio and several other states. I've been working on tax policy for almost 30 years at both the state, local, and federal level. What I'd like to do today for my remarks is discuss the gold standard of tax policy drawing from economic research that spans decades. Economists at the Organization for Economic Community Development, the OECD, said taxes need to be set up to minimize taxpayers' compliance costs and government administrative costs while also avoiding uh, tax avoidance and evasion. Taxes affect the decisions of households to save, supply labor, invest in human capital, the decisions of firms to produce, create jobs, invest and innovate, as well as the choice of savings channels and assets by investors. The gold standard of tax policy should adhere to the following principles. It should be simple, transparent, pro-growth, and fair slash neutral. A simple tax policy is easy for taxpayers to understand and for government to administer and enforce. The more credits and deductions in a tax code, the more confusing it is. A more generous standard deduction, for example, is better than many itemized deductions. Time spent by individuals, firms, and businesses filling out tax reforms is time spent away from families and growing the business. So first, congratulations to Georgia on your tax reforms of last year, making your state individual tax code much more simple and efficient. A good tax code is also transparent. Transparency means taxpayers should be easily able to gather information about taxes they pay directly or, independent, or indirectly, why those taxes are in place, how much revenue those taxes collected from whom, and how those tax dollars are used. A tax system should be pro-growth. It should provide the least impediment to economic prosperity as possible. This means a broader based tax system with low rates is better than a narrow base with high tax rates. And finally, what I want to spend the bulk of my time on is discussing the, princi the principle of being fair and neutral. Essentially, government should not pick winners and losers. Taxes should not reward or discourage different industries or businesses. A tax preference is specific tax credits that can go to different regions, different companies, for or firms or individuals that engage in specific economic activity. Economists, political science, and other academics have long studied the impact of tax preferences. The evidence is clear that on average, using tax preference is an inefficient use of tax resources and does not produce results that policymakers hope to achieve. Additional economic activity is costly, especially on the margin as much of the economic activity would have occurred even without tax preferences. In short, most business activity would occur without tax preferences for reasons other than fiscal policy. First, consider that the, what the research says on tax preferences. Overall, tax preferences is essentially government spending through the tax code. Government is allowing specific industries, regions, cities, or people to pay less in tax in return for behaviors or investment. On average and during a normal business cycle, the return on government spending is less than a dollar. That means for every dollar the government spends, the return in that spending is below a dollar, resulting in a deadweight loss. Government spending does not create stronger economies in the long run, either through tax preferences or direct government spending. Other research looking at specific tax preferences finds that these tax preferences are inefficient. The average affected subsidy is likely to change only one out of eight corporate location or expansions decisions. This means roughly about 90% of subsidy spending is wasted because that economic activity would have occurred regardless of the tax preference. So for example, here in Columbus, when Intel announced that they were going to build their new chip plant 
uh, in the nearby location in the Columbus metropolitan area, Intel said they would have moved to Columbus regardless of the tax incentive package Ohio put together. Other factors are at least or more important than tax incentives. These include, for example, in the Intel decision, access to a major airport, access to a major metropolitan area with education centers, more affordable natural resources from land to water to energy, and finally, quality of life, all played an important part in making Intel to decide to locate in Columbus. Tax credits that go to an activity that were already going to happen uh, is called what we call kind of buying the base. That means essentially what you're doing is you're spending government resources on an activity that was already going to take place that raises the cost of any additional marginal job or economic activity. Other research shows that tax preferences are also inefficient because they change how dollars flow in the economy. They give money to companies that are protected from competition that can encourage less efficient production. They can motivate investment and production decisions that are suboptimal and would not have been decided in a fair market. Other companies then may decide to pursue political favors and profits rather than focus on their core businesses. And finally, research has found that in many cases of economic incentive packages, companies fail to live up to their promises, producing fewer jobs and other forms of tax revenue. On specific tax expenditures, for example, it is not surprising that researchers in Princeton and other uh, uh, universities have found that direct subsidies can increase jobs in the subsidized firms or areas. Again, this is not a surprise because the government is directing a lot of money to these specific areas or firms. So then the question is, why then do tax expenditures found to be less cost effective if some areas and firms benefit? Well, the reason is, as we talk about the seen and unseen, uh, Frederick Bastiat says it's easier to see what is happening directly in front of you, and it is harder to see the unseen. In this case, it's easier to see the results of companies in areas that receive special tax treatment. It is harder to see the impact on areas on, in industries that must pay more in taxes for these subsidies. To a large extent, tax expenditures are taxing Peter to pay for Paul. Unlike the federal government, state governments have a balanced budget constraint, and you must raise tax revenue to pay for core, core government services. If you're using tax preferences to subsidize economic activity, that is foregone tax revenue and needs to be made up elsewhere. Thus, other industries, individuals, and taxpayers will be paying more as a result to pay for these tax expenditures. Too often, studies that evaluate the return on tax preferences only look at the benefit of lower taxes and government spending and they do not look at the impact of higher taxes on other areas of businesses. So again, for example, here in Columbus, we've had a lot of people moving to Intel, people touting about how good it is for the Columbus region, which is true, it has been good for Columbus, but what is good for Columbus does not necessarily mean it is good for the state of Ohio, because many of the people coming to seek jobs here have come from other parts of the state. That is less said essentially that Columbus is cannibalizing economic activity that might have occurred in less fortunate areas such as the Southeast Appalachian area or Northeast area uh, that has been hit hard by the change of manufacturing switching to a service and information economy. Those are cities like uh, Northeast Cleveland, Youngstown, Ohio that has continually lost population. If you're going to look at uh, evidence on the return on tax preferences, a good economic analysis will not only look at the benefits, but also look at the costs. There is no magic money tree at the state level that can pay for these tax preferences and tax treatments without raising revenue or reducing spending in some other area. Other problems with state-specific tax preferences is that sometimes advantages accrue to people and businesses living outside the state. Investors, business owners, and even some workers may benefit from a subsidized firm or area, but will not pay taxes to the state of Georgia, resulting in a higher deadweight loss. Research has found this is particularly true in areas where there's easy to move across state or county or even national lines. 
Tax preferences also tend to reward large businesses and existing firms compared to smaller firms and entrepreneurs. Essentially, larger businesses have more accountants, bigger staff, and more knowledge of how to take advantage of the policy process and the tax code compared to startup businesses and people with less expertise. So overall, lower tax rates is best for economic growth. Investments flow to what the market thinks that is best and has the best return on capital. New industries, particularly smaller businesses and entrepreneurs, will be allowed to flourish and thrive. The more tax preferences in place, the higher the tax rate is then needed to produce the needed amount of tax revenue. So this cre has created a vicious cycle in other states, where it has higher overall state tax rates, then require higher tax preferences for business to pursue that economic activity. My analysis is that Georgia benefits from an overall low tax environment, so you don't have to worry about uh, that as much as other states that have a higher tax on capital and corporations. In those states, we have seen that businesses simply do not expand without significant tax abasements, and newer industries are throttled in the crib and will relocate to areas with lower taxes overall. So in my remarks, I have discussed basically, you know, what the literature has found on the overall average impact of, the, of studies on tax preferences. Yes, some tax preference projects can be successful and create some economic growth. Uh, just like in football, you know, sometimes a Hail Mary pass can result in a touchdown. But an offensive game plan that relies too much on Hail Marys is not going to be successful. Just like any economic development plan that relies on continued use of tax preferences is not going to create sustained prosperity. For economic development, using dollars for core government services such as better education and infrastructure is a better route than using tax preferences. Companies want educated workers. Being able to make sure that Georgia is producing talented workforce that meets the needs of modern companies will benefit all companies instead of a specific few. When engaging in tax preferences, finally, you need to make sure that there is good oversight and accountability. Some of the, my fellow panelists have remarked on the importance of clawbacks. It is important that the state of Georgia has make sure that you have real benchmarks with clawbacks that are enforced and good legislative oversight of tax preferences. This is to ensure that taxpayers are getting the best use of the dollars. Any economic analysis and academic analysis that looks at the benefit of tax preferences must be a real evaluation. It cannot simply look at the benefits, but also must look at the cost of this program. Again, these dollars are oftentimes zero sum, where tax dollars taking away from one area to give to a tax preference to another necessarily requires less economic activity in the industry or region that is now paying higher tax. Dr. Timothy Bartik, who literally wrote the book on tax preferences at the state level, again concludes that overall tax preferences have failed to live up to their promises and expectations, and a dollar spent on tax preferences tends to generate less than one dollar of economic opportunity. So again, thank you for this opportunity to speak to you, and I look forward to answering any questions. All right, hopefully you can, well, there may be some feedback. You want to? Okay, what if you just turn that off for a minute? I don't get the feedback. Yeah. So I can we can type your questions too in the chat. Okay. Just I know he's worked with several states on reducing about six billion dollars. I know that's worked with tax cuts. So maybe he could go through that. Okay. Yes, a uh, Senator, you wanted to ask the question about, you know, how we've worked with other tax credits in other states. 
So, you know, a lot of times, uh, like Georgia, states have recognized that states compete on tax policy. Uh, businesses and individuals want to locate to places that are more attractive for economic opportunity investment. These are states with lower tax rates, lower cost of living. Uh, so a lot of times with the question policymakers have is how do we get to lower rates? Uh, and the answer is getting rid of a lot of times specific tax preferences and tax credits. Uh, we have been able to work with the state of uh, Iowa, for example, on helping them move to the flat tax uh, like Georgia, identifying specific tax expenditures, both on the individual and corporate side, we felt that were particularly ineffective. Uh, we gave them recommendations uh, totaling hundreds of millions of dollars that allowed them to have some of the capacity to move to a flat tax regime. We're currently in the process of starting a new economic analysis of Iowa so they can move to a flat tax faster than the original schedule uh, so they can go ahead and hit the revenue and tax triggers well ahead of time so they can reap those benefits. Uh, we've also looked, for example, uh, worked with the state of uh, Louisiana, taking a look at their tax uh, regime as well, giving them some specific uh, suggestions on how they can pay for some of their tax reform. Uh, particularly, for example, Louisiana uh, had a franchise tax taxing the property and wealth of businesses. Uh, this is particularly egregious, and so we were able to speed up and help eliminate the Louisiana franchise tax. And again, we gave them specific uh, targeted tax credits uh, we found that were inefficient for the state of Louisiana. Um, so the overall, uh, and not just in those states, uh, but in many others, uh, we've seen a great deal of acceleration where states moving towards a more broad base, low tax rate state, uh, for example, uh, paid for both by eliminating tax preferences and also states taking advantage of the fact that many states are running record budget surpluses. Um, yes, so um, I am not an expert enough on the part of airplane craft maintenance on the state of Georgia, for example. Um, I would be, a, a, a my expertise is more kind of looking at the overall use of tax expenditures and tax preferences. And again, I think, you know, what the evidence shows that there are other factors of physical policy that play at least as an important role. And I guess the question then becomes is kind of thinking through what type of economic activity that would occur without this exemption. Um, and so that would be my concern there. So uh, the mechanics of our analysis, yes. So, um, so I guess basically we use uh, macro models. Uh, so my original start of the career was starting in federal policy where federal policymakers moved to what we call a dynamic scoring analysis. This is back in the nineties. Um, at the time, for example, a lot of federal government policymakers only use static scoring, use multipliers to look at the impact of uh, economic analysis. Dynamic scoring uh, takes into effect a more complete analysis, saying uh, when you lower tax rates, you may get more economic activity by individuals and firms. Uh, it takes into account both sides of the equation. Uh, so we were able to pioneer uh, major federal models. Um, as you know, the federal government now includes dynamic scoring, both at the Joint Tax Committee at the federal level and at the Congressional Budget Office level. We are now working on doing the same at the state level, where we have built a state model where we use industry-specific analysis. Uh, we, use, uh, st we use basically every state using SIC code to replicate a state's economic profile, um, and then we look at uh, tax data to build a taxpayer profile for those states, both based on both corporate and individual tax returns, uh, designating those into marginal tax brackets using adjusted gross income classifications. Uh, then we use uh, elasticities on labor and capital formation, uh, using those from the Congressional Budget Office um, uh, as well to predict future economic activity. Um, I have a question, say, uh, much like the Intel example, uh, would it benefit the state of Georgia to use business activities to go to non-metro areas? Uh, so, so there is some evidence saying, you, you know, kind of uh, thinking through, like, what is the least harm going uh, for some of these uh, tax business incentives? 
Um, there is some evidence that there can be uh, some return to disadvantaged areas uh, in particular, um, and that it, it may be a better use of tax expenditures than giving it to major prosperous areas overall. Uh, all that said, um, the evidence there is not great in the first place. Um, think a bit like opportunity zones that have been used at both the federal and state level. Uh, again, we found that some of the economic activity that was used to aid disadvantaged areas, uh, some of that economic activity uh, came from people located just outside the area that simply moved uh, their business to take advantage of lower costs. Uh, so basically, it was almost, again, a zero-sum game where maybe you're moving across a county, you're changing a zip code, you're not creating additional economic activity within the state instead of you're making the decision of where that economic activity uh, occurred. On the other hand, there is uh, some possibility that you can get uh, some advantages from aggregation in some areas. Uh, so, for example, uh, 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 San Francisco, for a long time, uh, even with a poor physical climate, high cost of living was still attractive to tech people to uh, live there because you had so much tech expertise. And that shows, you know, that companies are often attracted to places where there's a high amount of human capital educated population. Uh, uh, as we're starting to see more recently that, that there are limits there. Um, the other part of the question is anything, uh, business incentives outside of the state? Um, I'm not quite sure I understand that, uh, Keenan. Other questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. It was a pleasure. Um, the, feel free to share my email, and I'd be glad to provide any sources for any of my remarks here today, or if people are interested in more information on what the academic research shows. Uh, I'm happy to provide that to the chairman and the committee. Thank you all. Well, again, sorry for the difficulties here. They had tested that out and thought we had a, a good system, but it was good to have his testimony anyway. So I think we've got our last uh, panelist here. Um, here. Yeah, great. If you want to go on up with uh, Stacy with the uh, Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Um, and Chairman, I, I won't take but just a minute, but we talked about last time that we were going to have a website and upload some of the materials from the first meeting and going to continue to do that and uh, I guess put forward where the future meetings are. But we also have an email established if somebody wants to send in testimony outside of these meetings. It's taxpaneltestimonial at house.ga.gov. And uh, we'll work on making sure we get that out to anybody that it may want to use that. And I, I believe both this meeting as well as a recording of Dr. He Heaterman will be available on the Senate House webpage. All right. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to speak today. I know we're on a little bit of time squeeze, so I'll fast forward. You do have a copy of our slides. I um, will not get through them all today, but you have them for your reference. Um, my name is Stacy Fox. I'm the president and CEO at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Um, I am a Georgia native. Uh, my parents built the house uh, right off Moody Road, Chairman Blackman. <laughs> so a hometown. And I may not have an SEC ring like our uh, Lieutenant Governor, but I do have a plaque in the Student Center uh, as a founding member of the uh, Arch Society at the University of Georgia. So I'm proud Georgia native and I'm very committed to what we do here. If you're unfamiliar uh, with GBPI, we we work really at the intersection of research and advocacy, really to inform debate, inform decision making, inform y'all's decision making, uh, to advance our vision of a state where all Georgians prosper. And you likely know that we have a team of experts when it comes to the Georgia budget, state fiscal policy, and specific areas of state expenditure like education and health care. Um, we are a strong proponent of a fair and equitable tax system. Um, after all, uh, taxes are for everyone. They pay for things we all share. 
Um, and we'll have a lot to say, as you can imagine, this fall as you travel the state and do your work. Um, but we're really thankful to be here today and really want to focus on the work that needs to happen around the tax code in Georgia and amplify a little bit of um, Mr. Hederman's comments around transparency. But we look forward to sharing our analysis, research, and recommendations as our process goes through this fall. Um, I think really the, the bottom line that uh, we want to share today at GBPI is that we believe that Georgians deserve to know where their money is going. And we heard a lot today about a best state to do business in, um, and that's really important, but it's also important that our residents are thriving. Both need to be true, and they simply aren't right now. We have, a, for example, a million Georgia residents that are food insecure. So we want to make sure that both are true in the state. And part of that is making sure that we get a good ROI on our tax incentives and um, programs throughout the state. I do want to share, um, and I can fast forward to this slide, I think, to just give you a visual here. Um, Unfortunately, this is not where we're uh, succeeding in Georgia. In fact, Georgia ranks 50th among the states as far as transparency uh, related to information and state disclosures on who gets and how we use our tax incentives and tax credits. And that's really what I want to focus on today. Y'all are familiar with um, Senate Bill 6 that passed in 2021 that allows for a limited review of um, 10 tax credits per year that can be split between the House and Senate committees. Um, but even those limited number of tax credit reviews have produced reports that say we don't have enough information to produce uh, a full evaluative process of those limited tax credits. So we need to be doing a little bit more there and wanted to talk about some recommendations around that today. Most states have provisions that require or incentivize hiring residents um, uh, over non-residents to qualify for tax credits. We don't have that in Georgia. Most states, in fact, 87% of states in this country cap large-scale incentive programs. Georgia does not. Um, most states permit disclosure of individual companies or projects receiving tax credits, but Georgia does not. And these, uh, what's happening around the country is part of what we use at GBPI to inform the recommendations I'm going to share with you today. And establishing really a robust regular review of the full tax credit system in Georgia is really your fiduciary responsibility. So that's why we wanted to provide you with some um, solutions to make that happen. We also, uh, this is uh, happening all around us as well, so just wanted to share with you that our neighboring states have adopted tax review cycles in which credits must be evaluated, all credits must be evaluated, including three years in our neighboring state of Georgia and four years in Tennessee and Alabama. South Carolina also recently just started um, disclosing company, ga company names and award values. Hey, can I add something quick? You said Georgia. Yeah. I think you meant another state. Did I? Oh, Tennessee and Alabama, maybe. Okay. <laughs> I'm so Georgia-centered. It's hard what, to say. What about Florida? Florida? Oh, Florida's three years. Tennessee and Alabama does that review every four years. Um, thank you for that correction, Mr. Chairman. Um, South Carolina also recently um, started disclosing company names, award values, and new jobs counts for its incentive programs. And Alabama recently enacted legislation to require the State Department of Commerce to disclose online names of companies that receive economic develop, development incentives. So let me just go back and share with you a little bit about our recommendations around transparency. Um, our first recommendation really is to enact a regular review uh, cycle of the entire tax credit. And the General Assembly could appoint a permanent tax review committee that would provide an annual report to the body. Um, and in 2021, we actually published some recommendations of what the outcome of that annual report could look like. What are some of those pieces of that report? Um, we also would like to recommend uh, annual disclosures of recipients of tax credits and incentives across the state, including information on um, jobs created, especially wages. We heard a little bit about that earlier today. Um, talking about wages is really important um, and disaggregating that data. 
Our last four recommendations include a sunset, um, adding a sunset to all of our tax credits in state. In state, you remember that even Dr. Dorfman mentioned that when he spoke to this body earlier this year. Um, it is important that every tax credit that we put in place in the state has some type of sunset, so it is not just continuing um, into infinity without legislative review. Uh, we'd also like to see an automatic state audit on any tax credit over a million dollars. That's happening, as you, as I mentioned, in over 75% of states across this country, um, and Georgia's not doing that. Also, requiring in-state residency um, for all tax credits issued um, is really important. I think you probably know that a majority of the job tax credits that you issue from the state go to out-of-state workers. Only about 19% go to in-state workers. And so we want to, um, Senator Tillery, you were talking about this, about incentivizing, helping those in Georgia get jobs and get good jobs. And I think we want to make sure that's happening with the tax credits that we're handing out. We also want to encourage y'all to think about requiring public reporting on total number of transferable credits. This is a large issue in Georgia. A lot of uh, these large companies are selling their tax credits on the open market. Um, and we're not we don't have visibility into that, and we should in the state, and we would encourage y'all to think about requiring a report on that annually. Um, and I think the last thing I just want to share with y'all is really, I think if from our perspective at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute, transparency is really the floor not the ceiling here, when we talk about building a fair and equitable tax system in the state. And, you know, transparency really just demands that our residents know where their money is going. And as fiduciaries of the state, y'all have a really easy on-ramp to doing that and wanted to provide you with some specific solutions today. Um, this is really about ensuring that our state's finances are managed responsibly and uh, effectively, that we're getting the best return on our investments through our credits and incentive systems, and most importantly, that they're benefiting every Georgian. So um, thank you all for doing this work. We really believe this is a great start. And um, Chairman Blackman, Chairman Hofstadter, we want you to know that GBPI stands ready and willing to be a collaborator to make sure that we're making meaningful progress this year as y'all do this work throughout the state and issue a report in December. Okay, and for, first question, and also I apologize. For, uh, I know you feel like you were, you had to be rushed. That's but okay. We, we could go over a few minutes if we That's had okay. to. So uh, sometimes when you're last, but you, I want to get back to that point. You said you thought we should do an annual review with maybe a permanent committee that does that. Yes, sir. But if I heard you, you're saying that Florida is doing it every three years and neighboring states every four years. Yes, sir. I mean, not every state is doing it every year. I mm -hmm. mean, setting it up to permanent at some sort of regular interval is better than where we are now, which is not doing it at all. Um, we'd love to see it happen every year, but certainly if it happened at some sort of regular schedule, that would be a fantastic move in the right direction. Is there, is there anything we're doing that we ought to keep doing? <laughs> Stacy? <laughs> That's a good question, Chairman Blackman. I think, um, I think what you're doing right now is exactly what you should keep doing. You know, we should be looking at this issue and talking about it and figuring out how that we can best review getting a return on our investment here. So I think this process is something we should keep doing. This is what we could be doing every three years, every four years, or maybe every year. Do, do you do you come to some of our our meetings during session? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I've been Good. at GBP for about a for about a year, so I've got my sea legs under me, and um, y'all may have seen me in the back this session, but you'll see a lot more of me. And you said Moody Road. Did you say something about Moody Road? Yes, sir. Uh, are, are you, you you're off Moody my Road? My parents build a house on Fox Bend right off of Moody Road, oh, so that fantastic. is fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, we we we're right down the, right down the road. <laughs> there was no Houston County High School when I graduated. <laughs> yeah, but, well, me either. But we're we're showing our age there. I know we? we are. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I may, tell me again what you mean in, in like in five over here when you require in-state residency. Yes. Uh, I mean, t tell me exactly what you're referring to there. Yeah, when we are issuing uh, job tax credits or any other type of tax credit or incentive for a corporation business moving into Georgia, we should have 
either some sort of percentage requirement of in-state hires, residents of Georgia, um, about 19, per, only about 19% right now, the job tax okay, credits for, the state. For what period of time? Uh, well, I mean, I think that should be permanent as long as they're getting the tax credit. Well, and that, that's, and I'm, I'm not trying to be argumentative. Yeah, no, I, I, I truly you. don't understand. So if, if a job is created in, in this place and somebody moves from Alabama to take that job, you wouldn't give them the credit? Oh, no, absolutely. As long as okay, they're that, a Georgia resident in, in that job. So if the, if the company's providing, let's just say 10,000 jobs a year, right, that we want to say a, a majority of those jobs, so let's say 7,000 of those jobs are going to in-state residents, folks that live in Georgia, whether they moved here or already lived here, we want to make sure that's happening right now. Well, I mean, that, that, that's, and again, I'm not trying to be argumentative. My, my understanding was if the was job created in Georgia, the job had to be worked in Georgia, Therefore, all the jobs would be in Well, state not residency. all of the jobs are going to permanent residents of Georgia. A lot of times we have fly-in folks or a lot, because of COVID now, a lot of remote working is happening. So not only about 20% of those job tax credits are actually going to permanent Georgia residents right now. I, I, I'd like to see that information. Yes, sir. I'm happy and, to share and, and that again, with the, you. And the, again, the question I wanted to have on that is when you talk about in-state residency, are you talking about... They're, they're from out of state, but they're working in Georgia for a period of time, six, eight months, you know, a year at a time, but they fly back home on weekends, et cetera, because if so, they're, they're paying Georgia taxes while they're well, here. Well, they're paying Georgia income tax, but they're not paying Georgia property tax. They're not well, contributing towards our school the, systems There's a lot of people that things. don't pay Georgia property tax that I understand. Not, I understand not, that. Not own a property. Okay, so th that was it. Again, I'm not trying These to These are argue. simply recommendations no. from other states that we've seen that could be And again, helpful. I'm not trying to be argumentative. I'm just trying to understand what means in state. Totally understand. Because th then the question I would have, and, and this is truly I'd ask you to help us with, help us with uh, the Interstate Commerce Clause and, yes, uh, uh, re related to that because I'm of the opinion that we can't provide something for a Georgia resident that somebody that comes in from out of state, I, I thought there was some sort of a prohibition uh, about treating that difference with the Commerce so if you have some information from other states on that, that would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to help on that. I mean, I think because of the interdependency of our economy, that's right. really hard to mandate, and I understand that. And so there are some past to solutions that we've seen that have worked in other states, and we'd be happy to offer those details. Any other questions? Oh, yeah, Representative Buckner. Thank you. I do. Uh, or not, but... Um, <laughs> Several years ago, when Larry O'Neill was the chair of House Ways and Means, we started putting sunsets on, on almost all of the tax bills. Sometimes some get through without it, but we've been pretty consistent with that over the years. And I'm the one on the committee lots of times that say, oops, there's no sunset. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm very familiar with that and very and supportive of that. When that comes back at the end of that sunset, there generally is a pretty good review of what happened with that tax credit. Mm -hmm. Would that not count as when you said that all of the tax credits should be uh, evaluated? We're doing that on a rotating basis, tax credit by tax credit, it seems to me. But you may see it different, and I yeah. just was curious. No, that's a great question, Representative. First of all, I would say based on our analysis at GBPI, there's a good chunk of tax credits that don't have sunsets. And so we, during this review process, we really encourage you all to look at all of them and make sure that each of them has a sunset attached to it. And I think, Representative, I would say that you know, it really depends on the timing of that sunset. If you're talking a sunset in 20 years, y'all aren't getting any information to really understand the return on investment of that incentive or credit until it's um, meant to be complete. And what if something's not working? What if you wanted to tweak it? What if you wanted to sunset it earlier? What if, what if you wanted to grow it? You wouldn't know that um, until you were getting to the end of it. So I think in any of our financial investments, we all are getting balance sheets monthly, you know, in our businesses to look how things are going. We encourage y'all to do that more often than you're doing now. I'd love to see the list of all the ones that don't have sunsets. Sure. Thank you. I don't, I don't know that this really is a question about tax incentives, which is what we're talking about, but just Georgia public policy, do y'all have a stand on where you are with reducing income taxes in general? 
do, does the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute have a stand on reducing income tax? Mm -hmm. Well, what we'd like to see is a more fair and equitable balance of income tax. Currently, you know, those who pay the majority of their income, about 10% of their income, are our lowest earners. You know, those that are making $20,000 or less in Georgia are paying 10% of their income towards income tax versus our top 1% of earners that are making over $450,000 a year are only paying 7% um, of their income towards income tax. So our opinion is there needs to be some uh, move to make that more fair and equitable. We certainly don't uh, support a elimination of state income tax. Okay. Well, I, was just, I, I thought maybe y'all were against reduction in income tax and, and you know, wanted us to try to spend more in the budget and do other things. So, just well, we have ideas about how to spend money, uh, of course, but not in this I, I have never spoken with anybody from GPB buying anything that has to do with the budget is near and dear to me. So I would love to have any discussion you would Great. like to have. So. I'll follow up with you. $20,000 income after the standard deduction hardly pay any, if at all, state income tax. Right. Well, that'll happen with the implementation of the flat tax I'm talking about prior to. No, I'm talking about with the standard deduction in place no, today. Right they, now. They, that they pay virtually nothing. No, they're paying about 10% of their no, income. No they're, no, they're not because the state tax rate is 5.75. I'm happy to share that information okay. with well, you. Well, how would you pay 10% on your income if the rate is 5.75? I'm talking about of, of your of your total income that goes out. It's not the it's not the percentage. It's the total income that goes out the door. Again, I don't understand what means out the door. You said their income. If they make twenty thousand dollars a year and the maximum maximum tax rate is five point seven five, how do they pay ten percent of that total income? Well, I'm happy to share that math with you and uh, and the analysis that our analysts have done. No, you mean income tax, right? Not overall tax. Oh, overall tax. Okay. Well, so I thought, yeah, Sorry I think about that. You probably Thank you, Stacey. I have a question for you. Did, yes. Does the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute think tax credits are racist? Um, I think that's a, a bold question, uh, Senator. I think that some of our tax credits uh, are built on racist policies, yes, and I think that we need to be looking at um, who's most harmed by our policies and making sure that um, we are not targeting the harm of our policies on any particular population in the state. I mean, we, when we look at those suffering the most uh, based on our tax code and tax system in state, is, it is black Georgians. Um, and so I think that is an appropriate question to ask as we're doing this review of the tax code, is making sure that we adjust for that historical and systemic racism that's built into this system. Absolutely. I appreciate y'all having having us here, and we certainly stand ready to provide information and be helpful, and I thank y'all for being patient for some of my missteps today as I'm learning, too. All right, well, thank, thank you for that information. Thank you, Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. I got handed it. I, I was thinking it was so long. Thank you for that information. Uh, the meeting is, is, that's the entire agenda for today. The next meeting is in Rome. It's uh, September 20th, and it will be right next to Berry College in a nice facility that our governor has spoken at. And uh, we'll get all the details out on that and work through the technical issues, too. So uh, with that, unless you need to add something. Uh, thanks to all our presenters and, and speakers today, and thanks to the panelists for being here. We enjoyed being in Savannah. We sure do. All right, meeting adjourned.